There have been some problems with Islam in recent years, and especially this year with a group like ISIS uh, working on violently subjugating anyone who gets in their path, uh, beheadings, public shootings, slaughtering, raping women. Um, this has been going on for 14 centuries to a greater or lesser extent. It's not just ISIS. You have uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria. You have Al-Shabaab in Somalia. You have the Taliban in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, you have Hamas. You have all kinds of groups who come to uh, some different conclusions about what they're supposed to do because they're in different circumstances. But overall, they come to remarkably different, uh, I mean, remarkably similar conclusions about what Islam commands them to do in this world. And one of the things that often gets put forward uh, in the media and by, uh, even by people who are criticizing ISIS and who are uh, even people who are drawing attention to what Islam does, there's a very, very problematic claim that often comes up. And that is the claim that Christianity started as violent, that Christianity is a violent religion, um, or that all religions are inherently violent, but that Christianity, even though it was violent, eventually became peaceful. And the reason that this is a problem is not just that it's false, it's that it's giving a false hope that something similar can take place in Islam. In other words, Christianity was violent and spent centuries killing and slaughtering every, everyone who got in its path, but through a reformation, people became peaceful, Christians became peaceful. And so if it happened in Christianity, obviously it can happen in Islam. Therefore, Islam isn't really a threat. We just need to encourage uh, Muslims to become more peaceful. What's the problem here? Well, the problem is that that's total nonsense, and so it's giving a false hope. And so just to give you a, a, a rough idea, when you talk about a reformation, you, you know, you, that, that, can, that can mean all kinds of things. Um, and here I'm not talking about reformation in the sense of a Protestant reformation. I'm talking about just Christianity being reformed from something violent into something peaceful. Um, when you talk about that, what you, what you really mean in Christianity when you're talking about that kind of, of a reformation is uh, going back to the basic teachings of the New Testament, getting away from things that came along later, getting back to... Uh, preaching the gospel, living as Jesus commanded us to live. If you tell a Muslim to do the same thing, go back to what Muhammad taught and live like Muhammad commanded his followers to live, you don't get a peaceful reformation. You don't get a, a reformation uh, that you know, would take violent people and convince them that they need to be peaceful. You see, there is already a reform movement in Islam. There is already a movement that's been going on for a long time saying, hey, we need to get back to the basics of Islam. We need to get back to what Muhammad and his companions taught. That is the Salafi movement. But that's been a source of lots of violence and terrorism. And so the idea, the idea that the situations are parallel is absurd. And we're going to see why by Asking a simple question, is Christianity a religion of peace? This doesn't mean that every Christian you meet will be a nice person or, or a peaceful person. We're talking about what the religion actually teaches. When, when I ask, is Islam a religion of peace, I'm not talking about what the Muslim down the street does. I'm not talking about what a, what a terrorist does. I'm talking about what the religion actually teaches. What does this book, if you read it uh, from beginning to end, what would you walk away with thinking uh, is the final commands of this religion? And you can ask that about Islam, you can ask that about Christianity. We've shown repeatedly on Jesus or Muhammad what the Quran teaches, that the Quran uh, commands Muslims to wage jihad if they are able to do so successfully. But we should ask ourselves, uh, we should ask ourselves, is Christianity a religion of peace? And here we would have to give a resounding yes as we go through these teachings. Um, I don't see how a religion can be any more peaceful than Christianity is. It's as peaceful as can possibly be. And so let's go through the teachings, what the religion actually commands. Again, it can be different from what people actually do. 
Some Muslims do what Islam teaches. Other Muslims don't do what Islam teaches. Some Christians do what Christianity teaches. Other Christians don't do what Christianity teaches. We're not talking about this or that person. We're talking about what the religion commands. So if we just focus on the religion itself, is this a religion of peace? Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to look at a couple of things. We're going to look at what Jesus taught about peace and violence. Then we'll look at what other New Testament writers taught about peace and violence. We'll look at, uh, very briefly, just a Quranic statement about Jesus and his followers. And then we'll see how this can all be misrepresented so that people, um, so that people would think that Christianity is not a religion of peace. So let's go through. Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 31. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, he's asking Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all? So he's asking Jesus what the greatest commandment is. Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Notice that according to Jesus, the two most important commandments are both about love, loving God and loving other people. Uh, this is different from Islam, where, where the central, where the, the, the most important teachings are about, um, about obeying Allah by going out and doing what he says, including fighting. In what are called the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, we'll read verses 5, 7, and 9. Jesus says, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. These don't sound like commands to go out and you know, violently oppress and persecute other people. It sounds like just the opposite. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 39. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. So this is referring to an open hand slap, that is, if someone is trying to insult you by slapping you on one side of your face, Jesus said, show him how little this means to you and turn, give him the other cheek. Let, let, him, let, him, let him slap that side of you too. Um, Muslims condemn this for being too peaceful. How, how, how dare you? How dare you not, how dare you not fight back? Um, so we're being condemned for being too peaceful. If we're too peaceful, how can we be a religion of violence? One of the most important passages on this topic, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 45, because this is what Christians are commanded to do because of God's nature. The passage reads, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So this was a saying back then. So you have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So Jesus says, hey, you've heard you're supposed to love your neighbor. Hate your enemy. I say to you, love even your enemies. Why? So that you can be like your Father who sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So according to Jesus, we have to love everyone. Why? Because that's what God does. So reading these sorts of passages, how can you ever conclude that you are supposed to go out and kill and slaughter your enemies when he says you have to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? Matthew chapter 26, verses 50 to 52. This is when people are coming to take Jesus. Then they came and laid hands on him, laid hands on Jesus, and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. So if there, were, if there, if there was ever an opportunity in Christianity for Christians to defend Christianity, by fighting, it would be right then, where actual soldiers are coming to take Jesus by force to put him on trial. Even then, Jesus would not allow his followers to fight for Christianity, to, to fight to defend Christianity. He tells them, put your sword back in its place. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Why is that? Why, why aren't Jesus' followers allowed to fight to establish uh, his rule and his kingdom? 
because according to Jesus, his kingdom is not of this world. John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Notice what he says here. If I were trying to establish an earthly kingdom, we would be fighting. But my kingdom is not of this world. That's why my followers aren't fighting to protect me. So if, if that's what Jesus is saying, that the kingdom of God is not an earthly kingdom that you go out and fight and march out militaries for, how could anyone get the idea that this is what Christianity teaches and promotes when it's exactly the opposite of what t- Christianity teaches and promotes? I just want to be clear here. Uh, we're not talking about what militaries do. A military, a government, uh, might go out and fight wars, uh, might do good in the world by you know, fighting oppressors, so uh, you know, fighting, fighting against Hitler to stop him from taking over the world. Governments can do that sort of thing. Um, We're talking here about what Christianity teaches Christians to do with regard to Christianity. You're not to fight to establish Christianity. So even if a government went out to fight to establish Christianity over the world, that would be contradictory to what Jesus is saying because his kingdom is not an earthly kingdom that you would go out and fight to establish. So as far as a summary of Jesus' teachings, look at what we have here. It says, the greatest commandments are to love God and to love our neighbors. He says that Christians are to be gentle and merciful. He says that Christians are to be peacemakers. He says that Christians are not to return violence for violence, not to retaliate against evil people. He says that Christians are to love everyone, even our enemies, even those who persecute us. He says that Christians are not to fight in his name because the kingdom of God is not of this world. Is it even possible to be more peaceful than this? Is it even possible for a religion to be more peaceful than this? No, this is as peaceful as it possibly gets. But you go on the news and it's, well, ISIS is going in and out and doing all these things, but Christianity was once just as violent, so what's uh, what's the problem? The problem can't be Islam because, you know, Christians used to do the same thing. Mm, Well, Christians did some horrible things, but it had nothing to do with the religion. When ISIS is doing it, it it has background in the Quran and the Hadith. So those are Jesus' teachings. Let's look at other teachings of the New Testament. We'll go through these sort of rapid fire. According to Paul, we'll look at Paul's teachings first. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Paul says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. 12, 18. If it is possible, so far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. Notice, not just be at peace with your fellow Christians, be at peace with all men. 12, 19. Never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. Don't take your own revenge. 12.20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink. This has to do with Jesus' command to love even your enemies. 1 Corinthians 16.14, Paul says, let all that you do be done in love. 2 Corinthians 10.3-4, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We don't, we're not fighting an earthly war. This ties in directly with Jesus' claim that his kingdom is not of this world, and that's why his followers don't fight like they're marching out uh, to establish a, some sort of Christian worldly kingdom. In Ephesians 5.2, Paul commands us to walk in love. 1 Thessalonians 3.12, he says, May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. What's that, just for your fellow Christians? No, to abound in love for all people. This is very different from what we have in Islam, where Allah says that he has no love for non-Muslims. He has no love for unbelievers. That's chapter 3, verse 32 of the Quran. Here we are commanded to love everyone. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another, and for all people. Once again, the emphasis, what Paul says over and over again, don't just seek what's good for you and what's good for the Christian community. Seek what's good for all people. 1 Timothy 2.1, Paul says, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. You're praying for all people, not just for the people you like. Titus 3.2, Christians are to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. 
How many times have we heard all people, all men, all everyone? He's talking about the entire world here. Other New Testament writings, besides, the, besides Jesus and besides the Apostle Paul, Hebrews 12, 14, we are commanded to pursue peace with all men. Once again, it's with everybody. James 3, 17 to 18, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Over and over again, it's emphasis, uh, these passages emphasize uh, love and peace, and it's all people. 1 Peter 2.17, this is the Apostle Peter, honor all people. We're commanded to honor all people, not just Christians. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9, Christians are to be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. 1 John 4, 8, uh, the Apostle John gives a nice summary of everything where he says, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So putting all of this together, uh, the New Testament writers, the, the ones apart from Jesus, they command us to live in peace with everyone, to feed our enemies, to love everyone, to do everything in love, to seek good for all people, to pray for everyone, to malign no one, to pursue peace, to honor all people, to be gentle, sympathetic, kind-hearted, and humble, not to war according to the flesh, and not to retaliate with violence. Again, how could, how could, it, how could anything be any more peaceful? than this. And yet, Christianity and Islam, they both teach the same thing. They both teach violent subjugation. Christians just decided not to do that one day. Is that correct? Is that right? I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is we're actually reading what the Bible teaches. What's interesting is that when the accusation comes from Muslims that there's something violent about Christianity, uh, that actually contradicts the Quran itself. Chapter 57, verse 27 of the Quran. Allah says, We sent Jesus, the son of Mary, and bestowed on him the gospel. And we ordained in the hearts of those who followed him compassion and mercy. Think about that. The Quran is saying that God ordained in the hearts of Christians compassion and mercy. So if Muslims say, oh, Christianity is violent too, not according to the Bible and not according to the Quran. According to the Quran, God made us compassionate and merciful. Now, if the Bible commands Christians to be peaceful, to love everyone, to harm no one, why have there been plenty of Christians down through history who've done all sorts of horrible things? And why are there people who think that Christianity is just as violent as Islam and teaches similar things to what Islam teaches? Well, there are three misrepresentations here, and we'll look at each one of them. There are three ways to misrepresent Christianity, to make it sound violent. And one would be to misrepresent the New Testament by ripping verses out of their context and distorting their meaning. You can do this with anything. Um, you, can, you, could, you could play something that I've said, uh, rip it completely out of context, and make me sound violent. So when I say, Islam commands its followers to fight those who do not believe, well, you could cut out the part where I said, Islam commands its followers too, and just quote me, just play the little video clip of me saying, fight those who do not believe, and say, look, you see there? David says, fight those who do not believe. Well, it's not me. It's not me saying that. I'm telling you what the Quran teaches. So it's very easy to rip something out of context and distort the meaning like that. And some people do this with the commands of Christianity to try and make Christianity sound violent. Um, you can also misrepresent Christianity by ignoring the distinction between the, the old covenant and the new covenant. There are different covenants in the Bible, and the one we are under commands nothing but peace. But that is another way to misrepresent it. You can go to a teaching of uh, you know, Leviticus or something like that and say, aha, this is commanded to Christians. Now, that's commanded to people of a certain covenant, which was tied to, land, to a particular piece of land. Um, there are certain teachings that are included in Leviticus 
that are moral teachings that apply to Christians as well. Um, but to just quote something from Leviticus or something that's part of that covenant does not mean necessarily that it applies to other covenants. Uh, so if you quote an Old Testament passage saying, you know, uh, cross the Jordan River, fight the Canaanites. Well, it would make no sense for a Christian to say, I'm going to go cross the Jordan River and fight the Canaanites. It's not a command to us. So that's one way to misrepresent what Christianity teaches. And finally, people can misrepresent Christianity by pointing to people who act contrary to uh, Christian teachings as if they're following Christian teachings. So if you see a Christian do some horrible thing, you can say, ah, you see, look, look at what Christianity teaches. Well, someone doing something doesn't mean that's what Christianity teaches. Uh, Christianity teaching it, that's what, may, that's what means Christi Christianity teaches that sort of thing. So let's look at these. <clears throat> we'll look at a couple of examples of passages that can be distorted. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 36. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. You see, Jesus is telling his followers to hack people up with a sword. He says he came to bring a sword, so he obviously wants people to go out and fight with a sword. Is that what he means here? Is he talking about a literal sword going out and chopping people up? Well, there are all kinds of problems with that. Um, let's just finish the passage first. It says, For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. So when you read even the rest of, the rest of what he says here, he says, why? I'm dividing families against each other. Um, a father will be against his son. A son will be against his father. Here, he's not talking about them chopping each other up. He's saying he's, he's bringing a sword that is going to even cut families in half. Um, if you want to know how this was understood in his time, the parallel passage in Luke, it doesn't even say sword. It says, I, can't, I came not to bring peace, but division. So it's understood among Jesus' followers that when he says a sword, it's talking about it's dividing. It's something that's, that's dividing people. In other words, there are people who thought, hey, the Messiah is going to come and then you know, all the enemies are going to be wiped out and there's going to be peace among all the people who are left and everyone's going to you know, live in peace and harmony. And Jesus is saying that's not what's going to happen here. I'm not coming to kill and slaughter everyone. There's going to be division because some people are going to accept the message and other people aren't. And the people who haven't accepted it, and they're, they're, not, they're not always going to get along. So there's going to be persecution involved. In fact, if you wanted to take the sword part literally and say that Jesus is actually talking about bringing a sword, read earlier in Matthew 10, where it's Christians who are on the receiving end of the violence and the persecution. So if you want, if you want to take it seriously that Jesus is actually claiming to bring a sword, the sword that's coming, the sword that's coming is killing Christians, killing Christians. That's what he talks about earlier in the chapter. But, as a matter of fact, this just isn't what this, 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 isn't what this is talking about because here, again, he's just talking about division. That's how it gets even translated in the Gospel of Luke. And how could we know that? In other words, I could look in, I could look in the Quran and, and read a passage where it says, uh, you know, fight those who do not believe. I could look at a passage that says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, and I could say, well, maybe that means something else. Maybe, maybe that's being distorted. What does that actually mean? There are a couple things you can look at. If you're wondering how a verse is supposed to be interpreted, you, of course you go with the context. You look at the verses that come before and after it. You look at uh, other teachings in the same book to, to make sure it lines up with that. And you look at how the followers interpreted this. So we can do all of that with both the Bible and the Quran. In other words, when we read a verse like, fight those who do not believe in Allah, in the Quran, you can look at the verses that come before it and the verses that come after it. Well, guess what? According to the context, it means exactly what it said. You can compare it with other passages of the Quran. These are the final marching orders of Islam. So that's what it's actually commanding. You can look at how Muhammad interpreted it. When Muhammad got that verse, he decided to launch a war against the Roman Empire to subjugate them. You can look at how his followers interpreted it. They went out carrying out their command to violently subjugate people. So we know how Muhammad and his followers interpreted that passage. We know what it means in context. What about Matthew 10 here? Did Jesus' followers say, oh, he said he came to bring a sword. Let's go get some swords and go around chopping people up. Is that what anyone thought? Is that what Jesus thought? No. What does Jesus say when one of his followers even tries to use a sword? Put your sword back in its place. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. So is it even possible to read the Gospels and walk away thinking Jesus is talking about chopping people up? That would contradict everything else he said. 
Which is why no one would conclude, if they weren't just trying to attack Christianity, no one would conclude that this has anything to do with violence. It doesn't. If it does have anything to do with violence, again, earlier in the same chapter, it would be violence against Christians, the sword would be against Christians, and that Jesus, by bringing his message, is bringing a sword to fall on people who are actually going to uh, believe that message. And so there's just no way to interpret this as violent, and yet people do and say, you see, Christianity teaches the same thing as Islam. Sorry, it doesn't. Let's look at one more, because this is so common from Muslims all the time. Whenever I quote the Quran to them to show that uh, Islam calls for violence, I get this verse, chapter 19, verse 27. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. You know that? That's Jesus talking. He says, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. That sounds awfully violent. That sounds very, very violent. And Muslims say, you see, it's Christianity that's a real violent religion. Well, what happens, here's a, here's a situation where if you read it in context, it, complete, it changes it to the, a completely different meaning. Um, in this passage, in this verse, Jesus is actually telling a story, and it's someone, it's a character in the story that Jesus is telling who says that. Muslims leave out the part about this being a story, and Jesus is telling a story about someone else who says that, uh, and they just quote it as if this is Jesus talking to his followers. Just to give you an idea, um, the story begins in verse 12, where Jesus says, A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then to return. You can keep reading all the way through verse 27, but it's this nobleman in the story. He goes away, then he comes back, he finds out that people have rebelled against him, and then he says, Those enemies of mine who didn't want me to rule, bring them here and slay them before me. Now, to say that this is a command towards Christians is deliberately deceptive. You cannot be honest. You cannot be honest. Read this passage and say that this is a command to Christians. In fact, if you wanted to go with the meaning of this parable, the story that Jesus is telling, the king goes away, then comes back, and then comes the judgment. Well, if, this is, if you're saying this is about Jesus, then the story is about Jesus dying on the cross, going away, and then ultimately returning to judge the world. And so what that would mean is the judgment comes at the end. You don't get to go around hacking people up or killing people. You don't get to do that sort of thing. That judgment comes at the end. So if you read what it, was actually, what it would actually mean to anyone who's, who's being honest here, this means you don't get to go around fighting because that only comes when Jesus returns to, to, uh, to pass judgment on his enemies. So that's what you get if you actually read the passage in context. And so the, the, the other ways to distort it by, um, by quoting Old Testament passages as if these are, these are commands to Christians, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was tied to a piece of land that involved taking the land and maintaining the land. So there were... Uh, passages that involved violence, Christianity is, the message of Jesus is not, a, is not a kingdom of this world, so it's not the same sort of thing. It, it's, it's, we, we're told not to fight, not to harm people, to love everyone, to do good to everyone. And then, of course, you know, pointing to an individual Christian who does something bad and saying that's what Christianity is, you don't get to do that. And we all understand this. You don't get to point to something an atheist does or something that a Muslim does or something that a Christian does or something that a Jew does and say that is what the ideology or the religion teaches unless it's something that the, the religion or the ideology actually teaches. And we've seen what Christianity teaches. It's nothing but peace from beginning to end. And that's what Christianity teaches. So is Christianity a religion of peace? We'd have to say absolutely. 